Hello, I'm Emma Belsky. From 2021 to 2022, while I was a student at Mount St. Mary's University, I interviewed several professors about texts that they love teaching and reading. I'm happy to share these recordings with you now as the Grade 8 podcast. Enjoy! Welcome to the Great Eight podcast, a podcast through which we'll be having Mount professors discuss some of the great books of our Western culture and then some. My name is Emma Weinheimer. I'm a junior at the Mount. I'm a communication major, math and philosophy double minor. And Dr. Josh Hochschild and I will be meeting with guest professors to discuss these great books. Dr. Josh Hochschild is a professor of philosophy. And today we're going to be with Dr. Sean Lewis, who is a professor of English. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much, Emma. Thanks for organizing this, Emma. I think it's yeah, a great idea. Thank you. Dr. Hoekshire, why don't you tell us just a tiny bit about yourself? So um, I've been teaching at Mount St. Mary's for 15 years. Um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm in the philosophy department. Um, that also means that I teach uh, extensively in the core curriculum. And one of the things that I love about teaching here is working with faculty who are from outside of the philosophy department, from across the um, disciplines, in collaborating on the great project uh, that we call our core curriculum. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that's relevant is that we don't always call our core curriculum a great books core curriculum, but more than most. Uh, we believe in common texts, we believe in touchstones of thought, and we want to work together in helping our students to appreciate a life of the mind through interacting with those texts. So um, I think The Great Books is uh, justly understood as inspiring a lot of our core curriculum. Fantastic. And Dr. Lewis? Yeah, well, this is my seventh year at Mount St. Mary's University. Very happy to be teaching here. My area of expertise is medieval and early Renaissance literature. But like Dr. Hochschild, I've taught extensively in the core curriculum on the humanities side. I'm the director of our Origins of the West program, which is one of our core courses. It's largely based on literary and historical texts mm -hmm. from antiquity through the Middle Ages. I've taught Shakespeare to folks of every major here as part <laughs> of our Western Imagination course. And yeah, I, I would just echo what Dr. Hulk Shield said on the importance of having these common texts. And I, I'd say the commonality for me is even almost more important than the texts themselves in that having a conversation that goes across classes that freshmen are reading the same text that seniors read when they were first here, that can expand that conversation beyond a single classroom, and that is often quite intentionally in dialogue with other courses and other disciplines. So uh, in Origins of the West, um, many of the texts we read are from Greek antiquity right at the same time that first-year students are reading Platonic dialogues and mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so many students make the connection of, oh, what I'm reading in one class, and they, they, go to, they do, right? They do go together. That's the point, right? Um, yes. That, that these, these great texts, these great ideas speak to one another between, among, and across disciplines. Um, mm -hmm. And to understand that, I think, in a pre-disciplinary way, just as these beautiful, wonderful, provocative things, even before you start specializing. So what I hope not to get too specialized in my treatment <laughs> of Shakespeare today, though I could go all geeky if you wanted me to. Um, but yeah, but that, that level of understanding these as, as a, really an amateur, uh, mm -hmm. in the literal sense, an amateur, a lover of the text. And you can do that regardless of your major, regardless of your background. Mm -hmm. I think that's important and an important aspect of the educational culture at Mount St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. And as a junior, I can definitely back up both of your sentiments. Uh, like from freshman symposium, I was in a class with biochem majors, accounting, forensic accounting, and it gave those texts definitely gave me a subject of conversation so that we could at least start to speak the same language. Mm -hmm. And um, my brother is a freshman here now, so as he's complaining about his Brave New World essays, <laughs> yeah. It definitely gives students something to, to at, at the very least, bond over. And I was with both of you for different core classes, uh, Dr. Hochschild for the Foundations of Philosophy and Dr. Lewis for both West Civ courses. And making those connections definitely, like for me as a student, definitely helped me understand that, yes, I am starting to put these together. And, yes, I am thinking beyond, like, what I'm reading. It, de it definitely at least gave me a sense of accomplishment to be able yeah. to start to make those connections. Well, I, I'll just say I love that you're continuing to make those connections. And you started your introduction by saying the thing that almost every college student would say, and I, I probably have asked you that. 
you know, what are you majoring in? <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I love about the Mount is that whatever students are majoring in, they do have some, they do have some of these common experiences and they, yes. they have the options that major in the whole, the whole array of kinds of things they might want to, but you, you don't have to come here knowing what you want to major in. And whatever you major in, it might not be the most important thing that you study while you're here. You might be surprised. Mm -hmm. Um, There are things that you learn outside your major that turn out to be have have more lifelong significance to you. Well said. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Lewis, on the subject of Shakespeare, um, today's episode is going to be discussing Shakespeare's play Merchant of Venice. Can you give us a little bit of context in which the play was written before we get into the content? Of course, yes. So, (laughs) 1600. Go geeky, London, England. No, um, so (laughs) The Merchant of Venice is first published in the year 1600. It was performed a few years before, so say late 1590s. And to understand the theater culture of London in this period, We tend to think of Shakespeare as this esteemed canonical author, the bard, right? (laughs) Um, High culture. And in reality, the theater culture of London was popular, popular in the truest sense. that You had nobility coming to the theater all the way down to the poor. You had some people who came for the witty dialogue and provocative ideas. You had some who came for the broad comedy. Right. Mm -hmm. So theater in London around 1600 really is an art form for all. Mm -hmm. And it's best to think of it more like we'd think of really well-made television or a really well-made film. Right. It has a kind of popular reach. You're also dealing with a a culture that is almost as litigious as our own, that that historians have shown that your average Londoner could be expected to be involved in some sort of legal dispute in the course of his lifetime. And you're dealing with a culture that has just lived through a very confusing Reformation. I say confusing (laughs) because the English Reformation is often contrasted with the Reformation on the continent in terms of how bonkers it is, right? Yes. Okay, yes. So, (laughs) so, so, So the religious then... Context here is that uh, so Church of England is the official church of England, as you'd say. Elizabeth I is its head. It is a Protestant church, but it retains many practices that are too popish for the Puritans, right, who are outside of the Church of England trying to exert their influence, moving it in a more Calvinist direction. Mm -hmm. You also have recusants, so folks who still cling to the old faith of Roman Catholicism who are not part of this. Something that comes up in Merchant of Venice is religious othering, right, with a capital O, people who are not our religion, not our culture. We'll Mm -hmm. see that that, that's an important part of this, of who's on the inside, who's on the outside. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to note that in the context of Shakespeare's theater, there are many different ways in which a person could be outside that religious or cultural group. Mm -hmm. One way that would be very hard to be on the outside, though, for someone actually living in London is to be a member of the Jewish people. From the expulsion of the Jews under Edward I, you didn't have an established Jewish community in England until the Puritan Interregnum under Oliver Cromwell. So even though London is a center of trade, it's possible that Shakespeare met a Jewish person. We don't know for a fact, mm-hmm. right? Um, so there, there, were, there was not a Jewish community here like there was in Venice where this play is set. And so this tension between Christian characters and Jewish characters forms a center to a lot of the action of The Merchant of Venice. But I think it's important that in Shakespeare's context, he may be thinking of who's, who's in my camp, who's outside of that, along more, I guess, traditionally sectarian lines within Christianity. And then I guess you could say also, like, whose camp am I not in? Exactly. So not, not just thinking who's not, a, who's not in my camp, but whose camp am I not in? Right, and how you construct your own identity in opposition to various factions. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that you couldn't do a lot of in Elizabethan England, though, of course, was speak out about such matters. There was, you know, highly enforced censorship throughout mm-hmm. Elizabeth's reign, mm-hmm. and so much so that plays are censored. You have rules about what can be put on stage and what can't be. Now, how these are enforced is a matter of scholarly debate, right? You often have uh, cases of a play that's put forward and you go, whoa, this seems way too political. Mm -hmm. So they rewrite it to be set in ancient Greece. And then it's okay, right? But the point is that I think one of the best perspectives on Shakespeare is that he's thinking through very potent religious, political, philosophical, cultural questions and problems through his drama, right? You, you can't discuss a provocative thesis in a public debate 
for fear of getting put in prison. But you are trying to suggest that he may be discussing something provocative or that he may have um, a political or religious or, or some combination of message that he wants to at least put out there, if not uh, too forcefully? Absolutely. And I, I'm of the mind that I get very uncomfortable when people start saying, so what Shakespeare says is X, Y, or Z. <laughs> right? Because we don't have his diaries, right? We don't have his personal thoughts. What we have are his plays, his public mm -hmm. works. Right. They're very philosophical in the sense of raising questions and problems without giving a straightforward answer, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's up to us as the audience to try to work through. It's up to the production to see how you want to play this. But they are dealing with some realities that are particularly relevant to Shakespeare's time and place, but also, mm -hmm. I think, have more universal relevance moving forward with new audiences and time, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is one of the things I think makes a great book, something that has complexity and depth to speak to a more general human concern mm -hmm. that may be read in different ways by different generations of readers mm -hmm. and yet stand up to those different readings and still have more to give. I, th I think that's really well put. Yes. Maybe for um, our audience and even for, for us, part of this podcast with you, you could briefly summarize what is the plot, and then maybe we'll hear from you about how Shakespeare uses that story to do something for his audience. Maybe like contemporary television or films, Shakespeare didn't write any of his own plots. This is an important thing to take away from Shakespeare. Oh, is, is that why there's this theory that Shakespeare didn't actually exist and he's actually a conglomeration. But I don't yeah. I don't I don't fully buy into no, that. But no, no, that's that part of the that's whole That's a much more stupid theory? argument. No, okay. no, I mean if you want do you want to briefly go down that road? Why not? No. Or why not later. Uh, <laughs> maybe later. Okay. okay. So let's, maybe let's, later we'll this, get back to it. This is an it. interesting point though, because I I didn't know this either. I mean I know that he inherited plots and I there there were common plots that were often reworked. Mm -hmm. But what do you mean specifically by le that he mm. didn't write his own plots? Did he, he didn't write his own. Okay. given a commission, yeah, you need to do a story about this or you need to do your version? No, in this sense, right, okay. that, that Shakespeare is writing like a lot of great writers write in dialogue with other texts, right? So the Riverside <laughs> Shakespeare, and just in the, you know, this is where you can get any introduction, right, that the two plots of Merchant of Venice, there, there are two main plots. One's coming from an Italian prose work called Il Pecorone. One's probably taken from the Re, uh, Gesta Romanorum. So like he's, he's reading other works of literature, works of history, and these are inspiring plots. What I mean by he doesn't write his own plot, he's not inventing this from nowhere, right? He clearly has inspirations for this. Where his genius really shines, though, is in how he reworks them and incarnates them with specific characters, mm -hmm. right? So for any Shakespeare play, you're going to find some source for the plot. But what he does to it and how he modifies it with characters, that's all Shakespeare. Sure. And that's where I think the real excitement comes. So the plots of Merchant of Venice are twofold. I'll start with the, the second one that comes up in Act 1, Scene 2. And one of the plots is sort of a kind of fairy tale romance plot. You have Portia, this beautiful, incredibly wealthy woman whose father has died and has set before her would-be suitors a test. So she complains in Act 1, Scene 2 to Nerissa, her serving maid, that she has no choice in who to marry, that it's all through this casket test. So anyone who is courting Portia in Belmont, be a beautiful mountain, this place sort of kind of near Venice but outside. In Belmont is this lady fair, Portia, and if you want to try to marry her, you need to consent to take this test. If you fail the test, then you don't marry her and you need to make a promise never to get married forever, right? So, so there's, there's some stakes involved here. I, I, I presume that you haven't read it based on that reaction or maybe, no. or maybe you haven't read no, it in a no, while. No, unfortunately so, I haven't read it. So here's the sort of fairy tale element. There are three caskets, a golden casket, a silver casket, and a lead casket. As in a coffin that a dead person would lie in? Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Yeah. Language, yeah, like a box, right? Okay. Like a coffer. Not like, yeah, yeah okay, th that got really dark. Yeah, no, no. Th th think of like, like a little jewelry box, Thank right? Thank you. Okay. Um, so a gold box, a silver box, and a lead box. Mm -hmm. The gold box says, um, who chooseth me will get what many men desire. The silver, who chooseth me will get as much as he deserves. Mm -hmm. The lead box, who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. Now, just based on fairy tales, which do you think is the correct box? The lead one. Obviously the, the lead one, one. <laughs> yeah. right? Right, obviously. 
And so one of the fun things in this is that you have two would-be suitors come and choose gold and silver to show how this failure works. And again, mm -hmm. it's not that complex to get the message, right? Judging based on appearances versus the, you know, the real worth of something and yes. putting yourself out there. So that's the, the kind of fairy tale B plot initially. Mm -hmm. But we start not in this fairy tale world of Belmont where, you know, it's it's nice living. Everyone's it kind of happy. Nice yeah. No, we start in the world of Venice, which in 1600 is one of the centers of international trade and commerce in Europe, mm -hmm. right? You're talking high finance and we open with merchants. So a way to think of the merchant of Venice, this is opening in like the world of high power Wall Street stockbrokers, mm -hmm. folks who are gambling a lot to try to make a lot. And the plot opens up with the act one, scene one, in which the fellow who's ultimately going to win Portia's hand, Bassanio. So Bassanio, if you want to make a quick protagonist, Bassanio's the protagonist, right? He wants to marry Portia. There's indications in act one, scene one, act one, scene two, and later on in act two that Bassanio and Portia have known each other before. They've seen each other before, oh. right? Um, so, so there is a, a pre-existing relationship. To give you a more, one of the sweeter ones, act one, scene two, Nerissa, Portia's serving woman, goes through all of these suitors who've come and they're sort of making fun of them, good laugh. And then Nerissa says, do you not remember, lady, in your father's time, a Venetian, a scholar and a soldier that came hither in the company of the Marquess of Montferrat? Portia, yes, yes, it was Bassanio. At least I so think he was called. <laughs> Nerissa, true, madam, he of all men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon was best deserving of fair lady. And Porsche responds, I remember him well, and I remember him worthy of thy praise. So there already has been some conduct between Porsche and Bassanio. Here's the problem. Bassanio is flat broke. And he's not flat broke through any kind of misfortune. It seems to be through a problem with incurring debts. So the opening, he's going to Antonio, an older merchant here in Venice. Mm -hmm. He's referred to as a kinsman once in the text, but then they seem to drop that convention. But this older gentleman who has lent him extraordinary amounts of money. Bassanio says in Act 1, Scene 1, around line 130, when he's talking to Antonio... "'Tis not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faint means would grant countenance." Right? He's overspent himself, right? He's, he likes the finer things in life. "'Nor do I now make moan to be a bridge for, from such a noble rate, but my chief care is to come fairly off from my great debts, wherein my time something too prodigal hath left me gauged.'" To you, Antonio, I owe the most in love and in money. And from your love, I would have a warrant to unburden all my plots and purposes how to get clear of those debts I owe. So how are you going to get out of debt? In Belmont is a lady richly left, and she is fair, and fairer than that word of wondrous virtues. He says, sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair speechless messages. Her name is Portia, nothing undervalued to Cato's daughter, Brutus's Portia. So classical reference there, but this complicates matters, because... Even though this is my own reading, I think there is something like sweet and romantic and genuine here between Bassanio and Portia. But the way that he's selling this to Antonio is, I got to have another one of those loans so I can court her. Hey, yeah. you roll your eyes, yeah. right? Yeah, so, because <laughs> again, you're going up against literal princes trying to win her hand. This is true. And so, so you're taking another loan from Antonio to do this. Yeah, Dr. Hookshield. Well, I was just going to say, like, I, I find this enthralling and your passion for the play is... I, I want to take a whole class on it with you, but I'm I'm worried that we don't yet have an overview of like what the play is about. Sure. So the play is about this, which I was just getting to before you interrupted me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, of this. So I, mean, I see. Let, let me say this yeah. much more though. The setup that you've given makes it very clear that personal stakes, risk, gamble, mm -hmm. or realizing that if 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 you make the wrong choice. Um, you might lose a lot. So all of those seem to be themes that you've set up yes. right from the start. And yeah, I'm just, I'm curious, are those the themes that are carried through? And what is, if people were given the very short plot summary, sure. what happens in the play? Right. Well, Antonio doesn't have the money. As a good merchant, all of his ventures, he doesn't have any liquidity, right? He's, he's invested all over. But he takes out a loan on Bassanio's behalf with an enemy of his, Shylock, who's a money lender. 
um, Jewish money lender whom Antonio hates and hates to a level beyond what like common 16th century anti-Semitism would have, right? Mm -hmm. Shylock talks about how Antonio publicly berates him, spits on him in public, but apparently has nowhere else to go. So Antonio takes out a loan of 3,000 ducats, which, you know, that, that's fake money to us. I, I did the calculations, it's a little over $2 million, right? So a, a, an ex a substantial loan. And Shylock, for his part, says that, you know what, let's, let's make this fun. He says, to buy his favor, I extend this friendship, saying, okay, I won't take interest on this loan, but how about this? If you forfeit, and Antonio's sure, there's no way I'm forfeiting this. I'll get back thrice that money next month. This is just like Shylock poking fun at him in a merry jest, right? Let forfeit be nominated for you of an equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and taken from what part of your body pleaseth me. So, you know, Antonio, if you forfeit on this, I get to cut a pound of your flesh off. And Antonio takes that, thinking that he'll be safe. Maybe thinking that he doesn't really mean it or that he's just... Or it's... It's, it's, a, it's an empty threat. Yeah, he says, content of faith, I'll seal to that bond and say there's much kindness in the Jew. Again, Antonio hates Shylock, and he says so to his face. Shylock knows that, and apparently this is either a kindness on Shylock's part, Shylock has a merry jest, right? This is going to be a joke to try to make amends with you. But there's no danger in that happening. Well, Bassanio takes the $2 million and successfully wins Portia's hand, right? He chooses the lead casket. Unfortunately, something has happened between now and then. Shylock's daughter has eloped with a Christian. With the help of Antonio, oh, right? So his daughter has now stealing a lot of his money. And... There's a turning point here in Act 3, Scene 1, in which Shylock suddenly realizes, you know what? I'm going to hold Antonio to his bond. You know, it, it seems to be a joke before, but now, I'm not going to use profanity on this podcast, but you know what? I'm going to take that pound of flesh, because that bastard deserves it for mm -hmm. helping take my daughter away and my money. And suddenly, we have mortal stakes. Bassanio gets a letter from Antonio saying, hey, I'm going to be killed, but please come back to Venice if you want, kind of in this weird passive-aggressive way. And so Bassanio goes back to be with Antonio at the trial. The climax of this whole play is Act 4, which is this trial. And in a twist that you might see coming in Shakespeare, um, a young lawyer comes to try to decide the outcome, one young Balthasar, who's Portia in disguise. So as with a lot of Shakespeare's heroines, you get Portia dressing as a man, going into this court of law, and essentially presiding over the hearing. And so th these two plots are then woven together, the kind of serious, tragic, high-stakes finance plot of Venice and the world of Belmont coming together. And where, the, the, where it turns is this famous quality of mercy speech, right? Uh, Portia talks about mercy, how beautiful mercy is. It's worth reading part of it. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. So for the sake of time, just like the Jew has to be merciful. And he says, no. Right? I don't need to be merciful. The law upon my head, I have this bond. And, and she has some mixed motives in asking for mercy. So, it, I mean, there could be some, some lovely theological purity there, but she's going to get something out of his mercy, all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's, that's, I think, one of the complexities I want to get to here. So you chide me for loving no, the text sorry, too much. I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> but no, but uh, so the, the turning point here is that she rules that, yes, the Shylock is entitled to a pound of his flesh, cut off from the part nearest his heart, but the bond says nothing about blood. So take that pound of flesh. Go ahead, cut away a pound of flesh. But if you spill one drop of blood, the bond is forfeit, and now Shylock is on trial for putting the life of a Venetian in risk. Right? So that's the big twist, right? This, this, kind of, this kind of legal, legal technicality. Loopholes. This loophole, yeah. That can, and, then, and then you have a twist which, for contemporary audiences, can be really hard to look at. Then suddenly, now, so, so Shylock says, you know what, fine. I forfeit it, I'm leaving. But then Portia really holds him to it, saying, no, now you've threatened the life of a Venetian citizen, now your life is at, on the line, unless Antonio shows you mercy. So Antonio says, you know, of half his goods, I'm content, so long as he makes his daughter and his new son-in-law his heirs. And one more thing, he has to become a Christian. Throughout this play, right, Shylock has prided himself on being Jewish. Mm -hmm. He's been persecuted for it, spat upon by Antonio for it, but it's part of who he is, being one of these religious others. And even that is taken away from him. And particularly in the 21st century, 
that's a really hard thing to play. What's even harder to play is than act five, right? There's this kind of comic ending to this like deathly serious moment where Shylock is not just stripped of his wealth, but his own I- religious identity, mm-hmm. which again, if you think about Shakespeare's original audience, some of whom might be secretly Catholic or Puritan, Ooh. that that's, yeah, that's a, that's a palpable sign. But then the plot resolves in a way that might be kind of surprising for that plot summary that I just gave that, Portia has given a ring to Bassanio, like an engagement ring, um, and say, you don't part with this. And then as this lawyer, she says, you know what? I won't take any payment. Just give me that ring of yours so, as a test, right? And, and Antonio sort of berates him, like, we owe this lawyer my life. Like, give him the ring for crying out loud. And so even though Bassanio initially resists, Antonio persuades him to give the ring to this lawyer. And so, and that happens too with uh, Nerissa and her husband, Graziano. Nerissa's there as the Clark. So in Act 5, you get this moment where Portia says, you know, my husband would never give away his ring. And Bassanio has to admit that he just did. And then Portia has some real fun, saying that, you know what, I, I will not come to your bed until I see that ring. You know, I'm not going to consummate this marriage, so we're not going to be technically married. So all that money you think is yours, you know, if you're not technically married, you still can get that annulled. Uh, mm-hmm. pour, putting... Bassanio in the crosshairs, and then saying, you know what, I- I'll just lay with that doctor of the law. You know, he has the ring, so I'll sleep with him. And then she ends up, Antonio steps in, you know what, forgive him, she says, fine, I'll be merciful, and here, take this ring. And it's the same one. And Bassanio recommends, by, by heaven, this is the ring I gave the Clarks, and I had it of him. Pardon me, Bassanio, but I slept with the lawyer. And so, again, she's <laughs> just playing him the whole time. And then she reveals everything, big reveal that, by the way, I was the lawyer. I'm the one who got him out of this. And so there's a kind of comic ending to the play, a comic ending though, that's dealing with very serious themes here. right? And so I think if you're getting to... What makes this a great book, a great text? Part of that is the way that Shakespeare's playing with genre here, right? This is not a straight-up tragedy. This is not a straight-up comedy. It's really hard to produce this play without having the scenes with Shylock be, like, really tense, as well as really filled with pathos. I mean, this is an important point that I think gets to some of the moral imagination of the play, too, that Shylock is an antagonist, right? He's, he's against the people we're supposed to be rooting for, right? These Venetians who overextend their credit and spend money that's not theirs and don't really show a lot of mercy to people outside of their friend group. But So Shylock's the antagonist, right? We're not supposed to be rooting for him. Mm-hmm. And yet Shylock is not just an anti-Semitic stereotype, right? If you put Shylock next to some other Jewish characters on the London stage around 1600, you know, most Jewish characters are strictly other with a capital O. They're like Barabbas in The Jew of Malta by uh, Christopher Marlowe, who's just like evil for evil's sake, right? And this caricature. I mean, there's something sympathetic about Shylock. For you Absolutely, actually. right? You can pity him. You can hope that he gets justice in a way or that he's not taken advantage of. Yeah, or at very least you're conflicted. Even if you're an original audience, he's just lost his daughter, mm-hmm. right? What father is not going to sympathize with a man who's dealing with the fact that his daughter ran away and married somebody he didn't want. Kind of like Shakespeare did. That's biographical. Um, (laughs) Or the fact that he's lost huge sums of money. And he's a money lender. That's his whole business. And to to go even further with that, Shakespeare didn't have to do this, right? He could have made him just a straight-up villain. But he humanizes him through those places. And then in Act 3, Scene 1, some of the more minor of Venetian characters trying to pursue, well, you're not going to take Antonio's flesh. What good is that? What are you going to do with that? You need to forgive him. And he's like, I don't have to do that at all. I have this bond. And then what follows is one of the more famous passages from The Merchant of Venice. And I'll stop at a certain point for a specific reason. Shylock says, like, what is he going to do with his flesh to bait fish with? If it will do nothing else, it will feed my vengeance. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million. So again, he's, he's cost about $350 million worth of business. He's laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, and what's his reason? Why has Antonio done all this? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? 
If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And I'll stop there because that is such a beautiful portrait of a kind of human ethic. Like beyond our religious differences, our ethnic differences, aren't I a human being? Is the only reason he hates me is because I'm a Jew? Aren't I human like he is? And so this passage, I think, has been justly excerpted as speaking for a kind of humanist ethic of looking beyond the differences of your supposed other or enemy and saying, like, he's also a human being. So I think that one of the things that the Merchant of Venice does that makes it so great is that it imagines an antagonist who is still very human and very sympathetic. Yeah. You can root against Shylock, but it's really hard to outright hate him as though he's a villain. He's a human being just like you are. And if it were at that, you might be left the kind of superficial, oh, we're all human, right? Which, I, I mean... I believe in that ethic firmly, but at the same time, Shakespeare never lets the plot get away from him because note what happens right after that, right? So I'm a human just like all of you. And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Whoa, now that's chilling. To say, if I'm like you in everything, I'm going to be like you in revenge, right? You have taught me how to behave. If I wrong you, you take your revenge on me, so you know what? I'm going to do it right back to you. And that's what I think is so beautifully complex here, right? Shylock is a very human that's, character. That's arguably yeah. part of a humanistic ethic, right? Right. That you should, I mean, I'm not a Kantian, but Kant said <laughs> you shouldn't act in such a way that you couldn't universalize that other people act that way. So even if you think someone's acting wrongly, you can help show them that they're acting wrongly by saying, how would you like it if Guess I what? did that to you? Yeah, right. you Christians do this to Jews all the time. I'm going to be a Jew doing it to a Christian. Yeah. Right. yeah. So again, I think that Shakespeare's dramatizing on stage a really powerful ethical observation. If you treat the other in a way that you yourself wouldn't be treated, well, first of all, that doesn't seem to be terribly Christian, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There's also a biblical text I want to get to in a second. Anyway, I think that Shakespeare writes this complex play that isn't a straight-up tragedy, isn't a straight-up comedy. You have tragic and comic characters inhabiting the same world, mm -hmm. which is our own world. It could be Venice in 1600, could be Man Lower Manhattan in 2020. Part of what makes this place so problematic is that you have these, like, more general plot points being incarnated in the messy world of a market economy where people have to risk things um, and sometimes fall afoul of that risk. And so, and even in this plea for mercy, a less charitable reading towards Shylock would be, okay, oh, Shylock is all for the letter of the law and he needs to learn this lesson about mercy. And so the Christians triumph, they're the merciful ones, case closed. Can I ask a question Please, at this ask, point? So yeah. this, this is a philosophy professor question, but I think philosophy professors need English professors to help answer it. It's commonly thought, and your, your last comment actually sort of suggests this, right, that this is a common assumption that maybe needs to be challenged. The justice and mercy are opposed, right? And arguably Shakespeare is designing this play to challenge that. But does he successfully challenge that? Does he show in the end that true justice and true mercy ultimately lead to the same place? Or is there, is there some sense in which one is superior and has to trump the other one, whichever, I mean, you see the question. So do you think this play provides an answer to that question? Or does it simply articulate the question for us to keep puzzling over? Again, going back to a former comment, I'm really wary about nailing down and saying, and Shakespeare is saying this about justice and mercy, right? Fair. What I can say is that he is raising this debate. And this is why I think Act 5 is so important. This act that's ruled over by Portia. She's in total control. She's having fun at her new husband's expense. As an embodiment of justice. Pointing out that... Okay, we Christians are all about mercy, but hey guys, you might want to be a little bit less lax in how you engage yourself to others, right? That, that justice still has a place here. In justice, she could say, okay, Bassanio, you promised not to give away my ring, so guess what? We're getting this annulled. 
And she doesn't. The play ends happily with the newlyweds going off to bed. Bum, bum, wow. But Graziano, he's a comic character, a friend of Bassanio, who also gets married. His last line here, well, while I live, I'll fear no other thing so sore as keeping safe Nerissa's ring, the ring that his wife gave him, who he also gave away, um, but gets back. In this, so, like, so the wives are showing their husbands mercy but also sort of stressing that justice isn't nothing. That the fact that these Christian characters are so overextended in terms of almost presuming mercy. Yeah, I'll take out a $2 million loan. Can I pay it back? No, but hey, it'll be forgiven. The play, I think, suggests there's something wrong to that as well. If a central takeaway is be merciful, like if you, if you want to do a, an overly simplistic thumbnail, that might be it. The quality of mercy is important. Mercy is important. But to presume mercy, to rely on mercy, right. To totally discount justice, that's also a mistake. And that's why I think Act 5 is so important. Portia toying with her husband just to underscore that you folks who rely too much on mercy have a lesson to learn as well. And this, I think, brings us to the Bible, if I may. Because a fascinating intertext for this, this was serendipitous. I have the King James Version here, um, which is a great work in itself. Shakespeare, of course, would have used the Geneva Bible, but I don't have a copy of that on hand. But the text is more or less the same. And in the Catholic lectionary last week, this came up as one of the daily readings. So this is from Luke 6. And I'm sure that Shakespeare read this and thought about this because he entitled a different play after part of this. So this is Luke 6, starting at line 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, and do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, so ye also do to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. But if ye do good to them which do good to you, and what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And this is, this is where it's interesting, because this is one of the passages that contemporary Christians would appoint to say, oh yeah, you sirs are evil, you don't lend it interest. And if you lend to them whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your father is merciful. Portia almost quotes that line in Act 4. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And measure, measure for, for measure, measure, measure for measure. Absolutely. This is yeah, one of Shakespeare's other really problematic plays that's written around this time period is entitled after that verse, measure for measure. And so I brought this up to my students. I taught this last week. How if you're thinking, well, why does Antonio hate Shylock so much? It's because he lends an interest. And throughout the Middle Ages, that was considered sinful, right? You don't lend it interest. You lend money and then just get it paid back. Lending of interest is usury. It's evil. And that's one of the proof Christians texts. were also notorious for taking advantage. That meant that Christians weren't bankers, but Jews were. Because, Exa- well, because yeah. you're not going to get that much money ex- except acknowledging the, uh, the opportunity cost of the person who's giving it to you. Right. So, so they, they were taking advantage of the fact that other people weren't bound by that high standard. Absolutely. So, so one of the few professions that was open to Jewish people in Christian Europe was money lending because we can't do this, oh, but we can use the Jews for that, right? And some Jewish people got very wealthy doing this, which compounded anti-Semitism, right? right some of them right, converted right. like the Rothschilds. Um, that's an old Jewish family. Yep. Rothschild, Red Shield, was a sign for money lenders. There's a fact, in fact. But, so if Antonio, let, let's imagine Antonio's reading this like a pious Christian. Ah, there you go. Don't lend, expect anything, so I can hate Jews. He's missed the entire point of that whole passage, right? Mm-hmm. Do yeah. good unto those who hate you. Love your enemies, right? It's like this 
character who prides himself on being a Christian, not one of those Jews, is one of the least Christian characters at the end of the day, based on this text. And I think that's another major takeaway from this, particularly for a Christian audience. Don't identify with the Christian characters so much that you lose sight that they're actually not following what's in the Gospel of Luke here. Uh, and even later on, that passage on, and why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Worrying out about the problems in other people, not myself. I think that, that that fifth act is a real turn back towards the Christian Venetians, and by extent, the Christian audience in London to say, okay, the foreigner, the antagonist, he, he didn't win, right? Happy ending, but let's not let ourselves off the hook here. And again, that's, that's a broad enough Christian reading that Christians of any background or denomination should be able to get that point. Um, I'm, going, I'm going back to the, the stage you set for us, what it would be like to be um, in Shakespeare's audience and, and what he was expecting in terms of, of who was there. Do you think that people after the original staging of this play mm-hmm. left examining their consciences about mercy and justice? Did they, did they leave just laughing at the funny characters or the the dramatic plot twists? Were there um, money lenders who uh, felt their consciences mm-hmm. pricked by or people or, or or those who had used money lenders um, and and thought they were superior and and maybe not forgiven debts who who left? Th- I'm wondering how much what you're describing would be something that would be experienced by an audience or is this something that requires like extensive pouring over the text? Yeah, I mean, again, getting back to what makes a great work great, I think that part of the joy and greatness of The Merchant of Venice is that it works on all those multiple levels, right? You can go to it in a kind of naive way and just enjoy a really gripping story. I've acted in this play twice in my lifetime, um, once playing Shylock, actually, and it's just a really enjoyable play to go to. If you, if you have a chance to go to it, go see it performed. And it can be performed in multiple ways. Right? I've seen productions and been in productions that took it in a much more serious direction or a more comic direction. Sure. As a production, you need to negotiate that. So again, I don't have a crystal ball to see what Shakespeare's original production was like, but my initial response would be it is perceivable at all of those levels, particularly if you're going there with, as a very well-read, well-educated person, you're picking up on the biblical references he's relating to. Yeah, I think you could walk away with this with a, wow, that was a really interesting exploration of what we find in Luke 6. Emrys Jones, a great Oxford scholar who's since passed away, one of C.S. Lewis's two T's in the apostolic succession, spoke once at the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society about a book that he wrote on the antecedents of Shakespeare. And Jones really established that it's almost certain that Shakespeare saw the medieval mystery plays before they were outlawed by Elizabeth. Mm. So you had these big, epic productions of plays based on the Bible, Mm. right? So the cycle that goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the last one of these was performed in Warwickshire when he was a teenager. And it's highly likely that he saw this growing up. And one of the things that Jones points out is that a lot of the like general structures of his play, he seems to take from these mystery plays. So why were they banned and what was allowed in plays that, that wasn't allowed in those mystery plays? Because it seems like you're suggesting that he might have been subversively trying to recapture something that went on, even though technically they couldn't be performed. Yeah, to recapture, but also to problematize, right? In this sense, that the the mystery cycles were outlawed in Elizabeth's reign because they were religious. Partly, they were part of this medieval past of England, back when it was in union with the Church of Rome. So it's part of our Romish past that we need to get rid of. So part of it was a reform move, but also just publicly performing religion could be controversial, right? Based on the religious landscape that I painted. Most people in England are part of the Church of England, though there are these folks on the margin who are more Puritan or recusants who refuse to be part of the Church of England. Within the Church of England, though, there's a wide range of beliefs from folks who are essentially Catholic, but for whatever reason are communing members of the Church of England so as not to incur fines or imprisonment, all the way to almost being Puritan, right? So this wide range. And so during Elizabeth's reign, there's a general policy of, you know what? Just don't discuss it. Liz- Elizabeth has that line of not wanting to make windows into her subjects' hearts. You know, believe whatever you want in private, just in public, it's the Church of England. And so I think those mysteries may have been controversial because you've got mm. these pre-Reformation staging of biblical scenes. So where does this bring us to Merchant of Venice? 
Jones has really demonstrated that the trial scene, you've got Antonio on trial, and then Portia, this female figure on one side, and Shylock, this antagonist on the other, that looks an awful lot like plays that would stage the fate of the soul after death, the judgment. So you've got this soul on trial for his eternal life. You've got the devil on one side, and then Mary on the other. That's another thing. Marian things don't tend to be the most kosher, let's say, in <laughs> Reformed England. But you have this play where, like, the Blessed Virgin Mary is arguing for the state of the soul against the devil, and Mary wins. Huzzah! And so June said, look, this is, like, the same structure as the trial scene. You've got Antonio on trial for his life, and for an audience who saw these mysteries, that immediately calls an, I remember seeing this when I was a teenager. This is like that, that soul on trial play. Mm -hmm. And so it has this deep emotional resonance with lots of people. But where it gets more complicated is that's very different when you have really fully fleshed out human characters. This isn't the devil versus Satan. This is one human being versus another human being. Mm -hmm. And a person on trial who, you know, is a mixed bag ethically. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that what Shakespeare, this is Jones' thesis, so I give right. him the credit. Right. Shakespeare is able to tap into those like deeply resonant religious images mm -hmm. that folks would have encountered in part through the mystery plays, but by setting them in the secular world, it makes them even more problematic, right? You can see Act Four of Merchant Venice as a type of this, you know, trial of the soul after death, but things get r much more complicated when you sort of actually feel for the antagonist because he's a human just like you. And Portia, you like, everyone likes Portia. She's a great heroine, but some of her moves in the trial are kind of ethically suspect. If I had time, I'd go through that. But right, right. the takeaway, I think, is for an audience who is used to thinking of these things, as I think a lot of Elizabethans were, it would be hard to step away from this without thinking and discussing, at least to yourself, some of these larger questions. Who is in our group? Who's outside of it? How do we feel about those outside of it? How are justice and mercy related? And how should we go about living our lives? So one of the things I, I really like about um, doing a Shakespeare play is that it reminds us that when we talk about great books, that we're really including a lot of things under the broad category of book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like you can make a um, distinction between, say, fiction books and nonfiction books, um, that even within literature, there are different kinds of things. We'll, um, we'll talk about epic poems, and this is a play. So this, we think of it now as a book, but it, as you've reminded us multiple times, this was something staged and performed. Other things that fall under great books could include myths that in their original form might not have even been written down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you've mentioned the Bible, which is a, it's a text, but that also exists orally before. Yes, yeah, exactly. This is right. the medievalist in me, right? Yeah. So many great books like the Bible right. exist as an oral tradition before they're written down. It's wonderful that we now have the technology that people can possess these things on, on, on paper and have access to them or even even through their screens, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I almost wonder if we've lost some of the, the sense of drama that yeah. you, you have helped to share with us as you as you think about the Merchant of Venice. I mean, you, you read some great passages, but it wasn't just that those are words on a page, but you're reminding us that this was part of a play. Do you have any advice for listeners who might want to think about how to kind of reanimate some of these texts and understand them in their original, not, not as books on a shelf, mm -hmm. but as evidence of a whole world or space that they could have access to if they made the effort. I think that the easiest way to do that, and the first step, is just reading them aloud and reading mm -hmm. them with a group, which is what we do here at Mount St. Mary's University. In, you really, you do, do that in your classes? I do. Oh, yeah, he yeah. would call on us all the time when we, we read The Tempest for... Um, Western imagination, and he called on people to play different characters, That's and awesome. we would we yeah. would read it scene by scene together. It was really fun. Yeah, so so the, the, That's the, challenging. I oh, bet a lot oh, of students was, find that difficult. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I didn't. I, I I've it. obviously had lots of experience with this when I was an undergraduate myself. But Emma, like. From the student's perspective, is that something that you all dread, or do you get through it and go, oh, well, that was kind of cool? Well, there is that initial dread of, oh, shoot, <laughs> I have to read aloud now, and I read it to myself, but now I have to actually articulate these words. So there was definitely, I definitely got that feeling the first time we ever read that out loud when we were reading The Tempest, but the more we practiced it, it was actually really fun, and I was mm -hmm. really looking forward to either reading myself or listening to other people read, just because like Shakespeare is... 
it's so dense and it's so beautiful and complex. It takes a very close reading to be able to unpack some of these themes. So hearing it out loud with other people really helped. And if I may make a suggestion, Mm -hmm. don't just read it out loud, but I would argue you should go see, you should support these Shakespeare productions. And if you're a theater major, make this your project. Yeah. Support your local theater, yeah. right? Yeah. Go and see this right. perform. Yeah, and a lot of, like, as I understand, like, a lot of these Shakespeare plays were written as political commentary. So not that not that we don't need more plays written, <laughs> but there's already a bunch of really good political commentaries that you can bring to the modern world. Like, there's a lot of modernizations of Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. And um, to go back to my alma mater, I uh, mm-hmm. earned my undergraduate degree at the University of Dallas. Mm-hmm. And there's a... A book co-edited by John Alvis and Leopold Alvarez, right, called Shakespeare as Political Thinker. And it's a collection of essays. And so in terms of po- political things, what's interesting, this would be an entirely different podcast, but what's interesting about that collection is the idea that because of all the censorship in Elizabethan times, Shakespeare is engaging in a kind of political philosophy through his plays. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I'm not comfortable saying, and that's why he says this is the best form of government. No, but he's clearly playing with those ideas, particularly in his history. Yeah, and and my limited experience with theater, that's one of the beautiful things about plays is that you can make these commentaries without explicitly stating them, and they need to be read and interpreted. And you can be very subversive in some of the things you might be saying, maybe not might be saying, and it's all in dialogue. I mean, obviously some plays have narrators, but you flesh these things out through dialogue the way that people flesh out their differences and their different philosophies. Yeah. You just reminded me some, of something, Emma. Two two years ago, I saw an amateur production of Measure for Measure, which is a play that I, I, I knew already. And they, they chose an interpretation to modernize it and play the Duke as a Donald Trump figure. Whoa. Oh. Which, which makes him a very unsympathetic, mm-hmm. it was their intention to make him a very unsympathetic character. Mm-hmm. And it was fascinating to watch that version of it. But I've also seen Measure for Measure done where the Duke is supposed to be a sympathetic character, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And he might be doing things in a very Machiavellian way. Uh, we'll talk about Machiavelli on another podcast. But nonetheless, a, a sympathetic figure who is doing things for the good of a community. And it was, it was fascinating to realize that even our own politics can be open to these different interpretations, mm-hmm. right? If you, if you start with an assumption, then you can confirm it through different observations. But if you look at things through a different assumption, you can see it from a different perspective or at least imagine how others might see it from right. a different perspective. And that imagining how others could see from a different perspective is... Again, I think one of the big takeaways of Shakespeare's art in The Merchant of Venice. Can you imagine how you would feel if you were a Jew in the Venice ghetto? Shakespeare has. He does the same thing. I won't quote it here, but in Othello, there's a speech in Act 4 that Amelia has that the structure of which is very similar to that of Shylock's speech in 3-1 that I just read. But again, but focused on women. Shakespeare has imagined what it's like to be a woman. Can you imagine to be someone other than yourself? And that's what I think one of the great things that literature does. It allows you to imaginatively enter into the world of a different person, hopefully learn something about the world as a whole through that. Maybe don't demonize your enemies quite so quickly. Do you have a favorite movie version of the The Merchant of Venice? Are there any good films? Because there are there are some Shakespeare plays with some famous film versions. Right. Like Brown Henry V, and there's a Much Ado About Nothing, I think, that's very good. And Is there a, a film version? Yeah, our Shakespearean in the English department is Sarah Scott, and so I would okay. yield to her, because okay. I have not yet found a film version that I thought really capture, does justice to it. I've seen lots of stage productions that really balance that tragedy and comedy beautifully, but... What I've seen is that particularly more contemporary productions tend to go very hard in the direction of Shylock is an oppressed, sympathetic character, so much so that, you know, all the other characters start looking really kind of grimy in comparison. And I think that loses some of the more lighthearted or comic or positive sides of the play. So real ambiguities in the play. Yeah. It's it's not meant to be black and white. Right. Um, the ideas of justice and mercy are certainly meant to be portrayed mm-hmm. as good things, right? Whether people are embodying them or not is, and, is, is, oh, a, is an open question. Ooh, in yeah. Play, like it is in real life. <laughs> and to get to to get to Shakespeare's artistic use of these of this scene from this mystery play, 
Is it a problem if you see yourself as the embodiment of an abstract idea like justice or mercy? Right. That's a problem. That is, Going back to Measure yeah. for Measure, there is a character, Angelo, Angelo. aptly named Angel, I who seems to think Angelo. of himself like that, I and that's a problem. Angelo in that play once. Oh, wow. so a very fun character, but a very, very bad guy. Yeah. So yeah. don't see yourself as an embodiment of a virtue. That's the takeaway. And that, I think, is a pretty safe thing that we could say Shakespeare <laughs> seems to be saying this. Yes. Like, regardless of whatever takeaway you have from however a director stages a play, I think that's a pretty universal takeaway. Oh, yeah. Portia is a wonderful character. I really like her. <laughs> but she's not the embodiment of mercy, clearly. Yeah. yeah. She's not quite Marion. No, not yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a great yeah, conversation. This was, do you have a has, do you have a last question you want to ask? No, okay. I don't. I don't think so. But this is this is a wonderful first episode. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time, both of you, just for my own personal enjoyment. This was fantastic, and I really look forward to talking with Dr. Hochschild again, and hopefully Dr. Lewis again. That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much, Emma. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thank you. Really appreciate it.